Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Severine, for the introduction. I also would like to give you a warm welcome to our international conference. It's a great pleasure to talk to you today and to have you here in Berlin and to come together in the CSC. It's, yeah, I'm really happy to, that we have this kind of event today and tomorrow. For those who are unfamiliar with the theoretical program of the CSC, I would like to give you a quick introduction, a very quick introduction, but I think it's helpful that you know the main ideas to follow the debate and also to understand my argumentation. It is our hypothesis that we are witnessing a form of social change characterized by the decline of the hegemonic role of the concept of territorial space, which prevailed the most important form in the 20th century. This is not to say that the territorial figure has disappeared entirely, of course not, as we see, for example, in the war with, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, but we are observing a pluralization of hegemon hegemonic spatial figures, including the conflicts and tensions and opportunities this pluralization process entails. We distinguish between four different types of spatial figures, which is territorial space, place, network space, and trajectorial space. It is important to note that each of these spatial figures is associated with an own logic of practice. So for example, we assume that the construction of territorial space follows the logic of demarcation and boundaries. This implies there is an inside and an outside of territorial space and a strong tendency towards homogenization within territories. Network space, on the other hand, follows a different logic, which is the logic of association, inclusion, and exclusion are organized through connections, linkages, and interfaces, or the lack thereof, rather than territorial proximity. The spatial figure of place, however, follows the logic of identity, and heterogeneous dynamic encounters. Its counterpart is trajectorial space that is organized according to the logic of crossing through space, like air and water spaces or transport paths. The logic of lingering and specificity, which pertains to the figure of space, are precisely not included in the concept of trajectorial space. Empirically, there are conflicts to be obtained between all four types of spatial figures. You only have to think on the clashes between the territorial logic of spatial closure and the network logic of control through the use of smart apps during the COVID pandemic, and you might get an idea. Violent conflicts often result from these tensions. A critical aspect here, and that's important when we want to think about the tensions and the connections between intersectionality and urban space is that we conceive of these spatial figures in bodily terms. So like in dance, for example, a figure not only designates a specific body posture, but also refers to the uh, unity of movements and the rules of combination. So a spatial figure is a body 
and movement code, you can say. In urban contexts, body movement also involve communicating with others through the body by reading the body. This also means communicative actions are attributed meaning through embodied properties and appearances. In urban settings, bodies will be gendered, ethnified, red as black or white. Their age will be estimated. They are seen as indicators for class. What is important for me in this introduction talk is differences made relevant with reference to bodily appearances such as age, gender, class, ethnicity, race, ability, disability, sexuality are not all equally effective in social settings. Some distinctions are construed on the basis of binary differences. Others, like age, are process-oriented or based on multiplicity, for example, ethnicity. But only gender and race are imaged as being immediately observable, biologically rooted markers on the bodies. And it seems so that both the sexual dualism and the white of color binary, binary logic have developed within the context of colonialization. In the wake of colonialization, gender has been established as a binary-based category to the extent that other regulation systems are no longer accepted, as, for example, Oyakonki Oyevumi shows. Gender shares this distinctive process of having become naturalized in the course of the colonial modern period with only one other differentiating feature, and that is race. The term intersectionality, a concept introduced by Kimberle, Kimberley Crincham, in the context of black feminism, tries to capture this phenomena of intersection, cultural, of their intersecting cultural ascriptions. Initially, it referred to a process of rendering invisible social discrimination at some specific point of intersection. For example, when US companies are hiring black male workers and white female workers, but not black female workers, and the black female workers are having their discrimination cases dismissed because the company can argue before the court that they neither exclude people read as black nor people read as female in the recruitment process, then this is a case of intersectionality and intersectional discrimination. In order to highlight key insights from intersectionality, we have decided to put a strong emphasis on the relationship between social construction of race and gender at this conference. This does not mean that other intersections will be ignored, but let's take the social construction of race and gender as a starting point for our discussion. Just a second, please. Therefore, my paper will deal first with similarities in the construction of race and gender, and secondly, with the relational dynamics of gendering and rationalizing bodies in the context of urban spaces. I hope that my 
contribution offers as an input for a lively debate during the meeting as both race and gender have one important aspect in common. They appear to be lifelong constants in people's bodies. And that sets them apart from all other differentiations. Age, for example, is an inherently transitory phase since people go through different stages of age during their lives. And despite the hardship exclusion may cause, class and nationality are construed as categories that still include the idea of social mobility, as, for example, Stefan Hirschauer shows. To avoid any misunderstanding, let me point out that the construction of race, perhaps more than sex and gender, may be similar, are imagination related to bodily features and or to biogenetic constructions. They have been linked to political agendas and used to differentiate between groups of human beings without any empirical basis to legitimate this distinction. In fact, many contexts in which these fantasies have been put to use, like the Spanish Inquisition, the colonialism or fascism, have, have exposed through cruel, brutal side of the social construction of race and of gender. These social constructions are motivated by attempts to segregate people with the aim to consolidate, legitimate, and reproduce power by recurring to the idea of purity. So when I'm talking about the intersection of race and gender here, I'm referring to the level of doing gender and doing race. Race, like gender, shows a tendency towards binary readings. The construction of gender always takes place against the backdrop of a binary structure. Attempts to introduce a third or more gender identity, so non-binarity or trans, are only enforceable through a practice of resistance against the dominant two-sex matrix. But the case with race is not as clear-cut here. There is broad consensus in research and in social movements, too, that this classification follows the basic binary distinction between white versus of color. In the case of whiteness, blackness, it is, however, not entirely adequate to speak of a clear-cut binary construction, at least not in the same way like we do in, with gender, because the of color part is much more heterogeneous than any other category. Black, of course, is a political concept in the fight against discrimination for all those who find themselves assigned to the field of the non-whites. But black has also attracted criticism on the ground that the binary construct, construction of whiteness and blackness is too narrowly focused on the US or the North American context. Criticism concerns the lack of attention to African and Asian experience with race and ignorance to South American forms of resilience, making use of very heterogeneous ways of ethnic racial positioning. These examples, however, are somehow misleading in that sense that the constitution of race extends far beyond the color of skin. 
In some cases, complexions uh, seem irre irrelevant, while the shape of the nose or the size of the head, like in the NS fascism, or the structure of the hair are of more central importance than the dif for the definition of race than the color of skin. This is to some extent similar to the construction of gender that extend beyond the visible primary sexual characteristics to include hormones or chromosomes or situationally the haircut or the pitch of the voice or the size of the hand. So what race and gender have in common is that both social constructions are undergone a process of naturalization and that they are regularly seen as properties attached to the body for a lifetime. The binary constructedness is shared by both constructions only if we specify that the dichotomy of male-female is analog to the binary opposition of white versus of color. All that suggests, at least for me, that an intersectional research strategy must not only include the issue of gendering in cities and gendering of cities, but must also deal with questions of racism and racialization and vice versa. Analyzing the close ties between gendering and racialization will enable us to explore forms of discrimination and more generally identify specific forms of social inequality and dominance inherent to these body-bound distinctions. The strategy includes the need for critical whiteness studies and min studies approaches to deconstruct the imagination of the universal and to, investi to investigate how the gendered and racialized body become operative even when subjects believe themselves to fall into the category of neutral or unmarked. This also concerns the complementary social construction of the city connotated to male and the suburbia connotated to female in the US, for example, and very often also in Europe, or the uncontrollable city in many society which is marked as gendered male, but also racialized as black. In our world where gender and race are naturalized categories, the gendered body is always also a racialized body. That is my basic argument, even if one aspect or the other may remain latent situationally. So let's look at a concrete example. Anyone looking for a new apartment in Berlin to buy or to rent will soon or later land on the website www.meinbesitz.de, my property. The homepage shows a blonde, blue-eyed boy smiling with satisfaction. In his hands, he holds his own house made of toy blocks. He has taken possession of the house with his full body, the head gently inclined over the roof. No one will take this house away from him so soon. Property Location Berlin, the headline says, the image of the blonde, blue-eyed kid who is red as a boy and as white is not only featured on the company's homepage online, 
It is also gracing redevelopment projects, especially in Berlin's eastern parts, as a huge advertisement poster extending over more than four stories. The house the kid is holding is not represented in an urban environment. It rests in the lap of the child who sits on a green lawn. The city context has completely vanished. Other people are only indirectly present in the picture via the child's gaze upwards, reflecting imaginary adults and the place where, from the child's perspective, big people usually stand. At the same time, the body posture leaves little doubt that this child knows how to get in possession of things. I wonder if the same effect had been achieved with a child read as a girl. Probably not. I also wonder which effect the real, ace, the real estate advertisement would trigger if it featured a child from an African diaspora instead of this white, blue-eyed boy, or a child read as having a Jewish or a Turkish background. Would the protective gesture survive? Or would we read it as some unfriendly takeover rather than interpret it as a protective act? In any case, it is conspicuous that there are no images of girls, of Turkish German kids, or something else protecting the property to be seen in Berlin's public spaces. Take a look on the public spaces. There are no girls, there are no Turks, no Jewish kids, like the blue-eyed blonde kid you can see, especially in East Berlin. Images referring to urban gentrification or to construction activities and property only rarely depict people. But when property and real estate is shown in relation to human activity, it seems the only way to do this in countries like Germany is to use a child read as male and white. If the message is to convey the idea of a friendly appropriation. Only white and blonde seems to be able to cancel out the logic of speculation or hostile takeover. The huge real estate advertisement on buildings throughout the city is a case of at once gendering and racializing the public space. I know, my Besitz.de may be a very flashy example for the socio-material production and maintenance of the city as a dense web of gendered and racialized spatial arrangements. Yet there are indicators that gendering and racializing are closely linked to the concept of property. For example, Brenner Bander, but many others, explicitly correlate the development of modern property in colonialized countries with the displacement and dispossession polities directed at social groups racialized as black. Property and race, she argues, are construed along similar logics and thus produce and reproduce each other in colonial contexts. Ananya Roy shows properly uh, property to be a direct consequence of what she calls racial capitalism, the power of which is derived from the fact that black people have been resettled or simply excluded from purging real estate. 
Asha Best and Margaret Ramirez point out that it's black women in particular who are pushing for the reintegration of black imaginary into the concept of home or ownership through artistic enactments and acts of queering and displacing the norm. Works by, for example, Nona Faustin are displaying nude or semi-nude self-portraits in public spaces and artistic interventions, for example, by Amara Table Schmiss, are staging ghost parades near those places where women were trafficked. Also debates on property and possession mostly refer back to the North American context. Colonial legacies and racialization issues are increasingly discussed in the context of German cities as well. Here, much attention is being devoted to street names, so all names after important men in the area of colonialization. I mean, not all names of German cities, of course, but all these names which refer to a colonial past refer to masculinity and colonialism. And monuments glorifying colonialism and they're being renamed or need for contextualization. Let me give you another example. In all major German cities, social movements have formed to fight for decolonialization. The city becomes here literally a battleground. In Berlin, it is one of the bitter ironies of history, at least for some of us, that the around 2020 new build imitation of the ancient Prussian imperial city palace. You can see it on the picture on the right. This is the very new picture. Um, has been turned into a major exhibition site for the state's ethnological collection. So this is the bitter irony that you rebuilt this castle, this colonial castle with a colonial background, and you place the ethnological collection there. Another colonial twist lies in the fact that building the new construction was premised on the demolition of the Palace of the Republic, one of the most symbolic structures built during the GDR uh, period. This is uh, the picture named 2005, or May 2005. This not only literally cemented the primacy of, the West, of West Berlin over East Berlin, it also put the prominence of the Protestant Prussian cathedral opposite to the palace back on stage. So what you see on the picture is the, the Prussian palace and the cathedral they look at, at each other. You see the old uh, postcard from 1900 and the rebuilt structure from 2020, 22. And in this uh, built environment, the cathedral and the castle, they look at each, uh, at each other. They are linked to each other. They have a similar dome. You, you build a special connection between both. But the GDR palace of the Republic is turned away. He left the cathedral away. And during the GDR period, the cathedral nearly disappeared. But now it's really a landmark of Berlin again. And you have to know the cathedral was built in the heyday of German colonialism with the personal support of Empire, Emperor William II. Through the reconstruction of the palace, the colonial building once again became a landmark of the city of Berlin. Similar to the My Property advertisement, the colonial, which means the racist structures, 
are made leg legible anew here in the shape of the city. And as we know from research about colonialism, there is also a close interlocking of patriarchy and colonialism. In the battleground Berlin, opponents to the decolonializing movements those, for example, who are proud of the reconstruction of the palace, are recurring on the spatial figure of the territory, for example, on nationalistic self-discovery and self-assertion, and more frequently on the figure of place. Then the argument is Berlin is in an urgent need of an identifiable historic center. This is cont contrary to the recourse on the spatial figure of the network or interconnections on which the post-colonial imaginary or movements operate. In urban studies in Germany, we excel in narrat narrating the history of industrialization and identifying all the critical consequences for social class. But when it comes to describing our colonial history and its consequences for racialization and racism, we are more or less at a loss. Let's say we used to ignore it. And both histories, industrialization, colonialization, hardly make any sense without incorporating the concept of gender in the approach because the history of industrialization is also the history of the division of labor and the history of colonialization is the history of the inscription of a binary code applied to the body. Many of us here in the CSC look on history in the same way we look at figures, which means we are interested in them as bodily performed social practices, body bound lived experience and embodied agencies. And this explicitly includes the practice of doing whiteness, which brings us again to the question of urban violence. Research, research in, on violence in Germany has developed a form of an analysis resulting in thick description or situated action directed to the bodies, as opposed to methods of investigating the causes for violence. Violence is no longer seen as the other treated as that what is different, deviated, or disrupting a good order in society. Instead, Heinrich Puppet's argument is taken very seriously, whose research suggests that violence is an everybody resource, which means that violence is one of many possible options for actions in a social world. Doing violence to the body does not occur outside the social order. It is part of an ongoing effort to introduce order into the world, which includes constructions of gender and race. The point is this, violence should be, the, should be seen as an integral part of modern society's obsession with order. What is common to all acts of violence is that they have a strong bearing on the body. Generally, the focus is on physical violence causing bodily harm to the victims. Yet the symbolic actions and signs also have the potential to cause bodily harm. The physical effects of symbolic violence is manifest in traumatization, in discomforting bodily sensations, in people's visibility effects 
so the idea to make themselves, for example, smaller, uh, to not to be noticed in actions like that. We have no valid data on how or if the message of mine besitz de, my property, oversize advertisement on buildings in East Berlin really gets into the bodies of people passing by. But we do know that sexist and racist advertising is often physically experienced as violence. We therefore propose to look at conflicts in urban contexts from the perspective of these kind of intersections. The topic of racializing, gendering, and counter-gendering bodies by addressing them, sorry, but the light is really difficult here, so I always have to, <laughs> to search for my paper. <laughs> okay. Um, once again, the topic of racializing, gendering, and counter-gendering bodies by addressing them through acts of violence is what we are going to focus here at the conference. I think we will look at questions such as how and when do people fall victim to violence in the context of urban conflicts? Thanks. <laughs> Which attributions are involved and how do they overlap? Which instances of social inequality are no longer visible precisely because other social categories are made features for resistance or resources for resistance? I'm very much looking forward to the conversation we are going to have today and tomorrow, and uh, thank you for your attention.